Hey, what's up, bro? Hey, what's going on, brother? How you doing? Good, good. I see you wearing that Buffalo jersey, or hoodie, rather. I, Man, <laughs> that game was rough. I know, I know. I, I'm, I'm still, I still love my Bills, but my God, I another divisional round exit. You have a prime quarterback in Josh Allen. Yeah. I think he is easily the second best quarterback in the league. No, no bias because um, I was, you know, some people argue that and say that he's the best, but I will have to give Patrick Mahomes that, you know, mm-hmm. that title until Josh Allen can has the hardware and the MVPs. But I think he is every bit as talented as, as Patrick Mahomes. Mm. Just when you have when, when you have um, an inferior coach, you have and look. Sean McDermott's a good coach, but he's not Andy Reid. Mm-hmm. You have you have Stephon Diggs, who, in my opinion, is not nearly as good as people think he is. He's, he was a wide receiver. He was in a top ten wide receiver right. when um, when he when he, he was in Minnesota. He was a wide receiver too. He was the second best wide receiver in Minnesota next to Adam Thielen. So Josh Allen has elevated him into a top five wide receiver. He's all, you know, John Brown had some of the best stats of his career in Buffalo. Um, before he unfortunately fell off a cliff from injury, Cole Beasley had some of the best stats in his career. And he was regarded as one of the best slot receivers in the game mm-hmm. when he came to Buffalo. I mean, he was already a really good slot receiver in Dallas, but, right. you know, yeah. I, I just hope they don't waste Josh Allen's prime. It, it would be a tragedy if he ended up like Dan Marino, mm-hmm. where, you know, uh, you know, considered like I mean, I think he's the modern day L. I think he's better than L. Sorry, but uh, is that a hot mm-hmm. take? <laughs> I like I'm pretty much a casual, so you know. Yeah, you're, no, you're not a hot more... take. No. Oh, okay. I think he is more talented. He is more talented than John, than John Elway. Hmm. John Elway has the accolades. It is a phenomenal quarterback, but oh, okay. no, I, I would I would take Josh Allen any day of the week over John Elway. Got it. Got it. Well, you know that game was disappointing, but let's talk about something. A little bit more, I guess, happy. Uh, let's, talk, <laughs> let's talk some jujitsu. You know, it was a uh, awesome rolling the other day with you. I mean, I feel so out of shape and taking that time off. Uh, yeah, just I feel like a white belt again. <laughs> oh yeah, you've you guessed out uh, what <laughs> yeah. like two minutes. Yeah, I was like tap tap <laughs> get off. Keep it. I last longer on my wedding night than. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I kind of wanted to ask you, you know, um, I, I recently became a dad and I know you started mm-hmm. jiu-jitsu when, you know, you were a father. Uh, how did you kind of like balance everything and dedicate time to, you know, get into, uh, come into class and, you know, continue your training? Um, I, I mean, you know, I'd have to go ahead and credit my, my wife, you know, she has done a lot for me to be able to pursue this passion mm-hmm. because it was actually, you know, I, I didn't start jujitsu until my daughter was what, four months, three, four months. Right. So, you know, I wasn't getting much sleep, but, um, I, I would have to give credit to my wife. She told me like, Hey, look, I know you want to, you know, you, you want to get into this, so just get into it. She's like, don't worry, I can handle things for, you know, for an hour and a half, two hours. And I, uh, started back in, 2019 and I haven't looked back uh, it's, awesome. it's been yeah like my you know if you don't have the support of, like if you're if you're in a relationship and a lot of times you know when you're in a relationship or you're married or you know what have you then it's very very difficult for you to not be tempted they might try to coax you out and say hey why don't you take this day we'll just stay you know we'll do this on this day you know we'll we have plans let's let's go here instead you know and I, I would say that if you, if you don't have a part of that supportive, or they might think that it's like you know, my wife thinks it's silly that I do it, but <laughs> she's supportive regardless. Like she's like you know, yeah, she's gonna go, you know, yeah. go to the gym and grab <laughs> one for one. She's like, uh, why don't you go lift weights? And I'm just like, I, I would much prefer jujitsu than mm. having to lift weights. I, I never found weightlifting to be, so, you know, a fun pastime. Even though it's something I love, you know, I have to get doing i'm more into accounts okay but uh you know i, I but i would say that jujitsu i feel like there's a skill that you can like you know you can learn at the end of the day okay yeah i mean that makes sense 
Uh, and uh, that kind of goes into the next question. How did you get into it or why did you get into jujitsu? But I guess, you know, you kind of answered a part of it. Like you mm -hmm. don't really enjoy lifting. And I, I guess jujitsu is uh, another way for you to you know stay in shape and get some exercise mm -hmm. in. But, you know, I would love to hear what your reasoning is. Well, you know, I, you know, I mean, as you can tell, yeah, you know, I think, you know, already I'm a big fan of the UFC, MMA in general. Mm -hmm. And, um, I, I always like I initially that had drove me into wanting to get into boxing, and that's why we, when we started, you know, you, me, and a uh, cousin of mine, we uh, we started into uh, boxing back in two thousand nine, and um, you know it was great, and you know we did it for two years, but you know I always felt that we needed to do, you know, like I never felt comfortable on the ground. I felt like if I would ever be taken down, I'd be fishing out of water. Right. So right. you know, I felt like you know. I, you know, I wanted to be, you know, well-rounded. So I wanted to at least, at the very least, be competent in grappling. Yeah. So. Right. Yeah, I think it was the same, you know, reason for me. But uh, it definitely helped that you started first. And then once you got really into it, you kind of just, like, brought me in. And, you know, and the rest is history. Um, I know you recently, you know, were promoted to Purple. But let's talk about how, you know, your journey to Blue Belt was. Uh, so, like, walk me through, you know, how it was when you first got into it, and then how long did it take uh, to get to your per uh, blue belt? Okay, so, um, well, I mean, it my journey, like, you know, my tenure was interrupted, actually, due to the pandemic. So, I was training uh, first 10 months mm -hmm. um, of training in 2019, and then the pandemic hit. Right. So... Oh, about 11 months. I, I was there inside of 11 months and then the pandemic hit. So, um, the, you know, I, I would say that I feel like I had a very, very difficult journey while in my belt because um, when I was training, I I was the newest guy there. Oh. There weren't a lot of um, uh, beginners that came in, you know, after me. So I was, you know, the new I was always, you know, you know, I was, I was the worst guy in the gym. I was the smallest guy in the gym. Everybody was <laughs> at least, you know, 180 pounds. Mm -hmm. So, um, and I'm, you know, I think at the time I was like 170. Right. So now I'm down to like 160 ish. So, but nevertheless, I was the smallest guy. I was the least talented. I, it took me a, so you know, just learning to survive and just getting beat up, you know, day in, day out. And then people would come in, there'd be, you know, let's just say former wrestlers that would come in. It's not as if, you know, someone that came in and they had no idea what they were doing. Mm -hmm. they, I would, there would be wrestlers coming in. And then, you know, so it, it's not as if I ever had um, much success mm -hmm. while rolling in terms of, at least offensively speaking, like, you know, for me, the victories came in defense. Like if I'm like, oh, if I'm able to stay off a submission, or if I'm able to survive, or you know, uh, any of the number of submissions that you know, let's say you know, a higher rank white belt or a blue belt would uh, get me out. So that's usually what I did: try to at least have these small victories. Right. And um the the reason why i think jujitsu is hard and the reason why i think a lot of people quit jujitsu mm -hmm. is because the temptation to quit there's an allure to quit it's not that you know we all do things that are unpleasant or things that we we may not immediately enjoy right like mm -hmm. you, you might have to do a project at work or uh you might have to um study for a test or write a paper that you're not particularly fond of in school but at the end of the day, you kind of feel like you're compelled to do it. Like, like you have to do it, yeah. Like, you, you know, you know, you're not, you can always not do it. You can always say, like, oh, I'm not going to study for this test. Or, well, I'm not yeah. going to study for, or I'm not going to write this paper. I'm not going to do this, you know, project at work. But at the end of the day, there's, there could be serious ramifications. So you don't right. feel like you have, you know, the option to quit. Right, right. So, but in, in jujitsu, you're, you're doing this as a hobby. You're paying, you're a paying customer. So you, when you say, hey, I'm going to go into the gym and I'm going to get beat up, you know, for like, I'm going to drill and I'm going to pretend like I know what I'm doing 
for 30 minutes or so while drilling. And then um, I'm going to spend the next, you know, 20 minutes or so. I mean, obviously, let's take off 10 minutes for warm ups. Mm -hmm. So the remaining 20 minutes of class, I'm just going to spend getting beat up. So um, oftentimes it's more than 20 minutes, maybe 30 minutes, right? You're just mm -hmm. sitting there, you're just, you're, you're, uh, and you don't really, it's not like striking where you, you see the progress, you know, that you feel like you get better every time you come in. Like you're like, oh, I'm hitting these pads just a little bit better, right? Right. It's, it's not like that. It, you, like, remember every day we would go, you know, we would come into boxing. Like, we felt like we were just coming out like 1%. It's not the case with jujitsu. You sort of, you feel like um, you you're, you flatline or you, you know this peaks and valleys, right? And then you just kind of feel like you level up. Like you know, if you ever played like a role playing game, or anyone that's ever played a role playing game, they would understand. Like you, you you do genuinely have like a moment where you know you go from like ninety nine experience points and then you hit the hundred, and all of a sudden you're just considerably better. Like right. you just come in one week and then you just level up and you're considerably better. Yeah, like and, you grind, and then you see the the result of that grind. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it's just out of nowhere. You'll just hit that submission, or you'll you'll hit that escape. You'll hit that sweep, and you're like, "Wow, I didn't I didn't know I was capable of doing it." Mm. And um, during my time as a white belt, like I know for the first five months, done. Like I, like there was the allure to quit, mm -hmm. and it kept nagging in my head, like, "Hey, you know, you don't need to do this," and that's what makes you just very, very hard to get into. Right, right. You know, I, I uh, you saying, like, a lot of people quitting because it's hard to do, and mm -hmm. but, you know, you sort of stayed. Did you stay because that time where you realized you leveled up, like you hit that first sweep or the first submission, and you're like, oh, I, I see my progress. You know, now I'm going to, keep working like do you think a lot of people quit because they don't give themselves a chance to get to that point like maybe they do one or two classes and they just get you know like washed and they're like yeah it's not for me so you know is that like your first time being successful at something is that the thing that kind of kept you going so I think there's the, that first wave mm -hmm. of, of people that come in. They'll do the trial classes, right? They'll do one or two trial classes. They'll quit. You'll never see them again. You don't remember their face. And you probably wouldn't be able to pick them out of a lineup. Right. Like, I, there's been so many people that have come into our gym, and I'll just say, like, I don't remember a good chunk of them. Then there's, like, a second wave, right, where people stay for a couple of months. They're like, hey, you know, I think I'm going to do this. I think I'm going to stick to it. And then maybe, you know something disrupts their cycle where like they have a routine, something disrupts it, maybe an injury or maybe, you know, life happens and all of a sudden you see them training infrequently and then, or they're completely out of it altogether. And then they just say, look, I, I you know, I just don't have time for this. Right. Right. And, yeah. So I, I usually see, you know, that, that second wave where, and then there's maybe a third wave where people, stick to it they go past the six months because really i didn't i didn't have a moment where i said hey i'm you know oh an aha moment where i said wow this i'm, I'm getting better at this five months in um and i i still didn't hit my first submission i think i probably didn't hit a f submission maybe about six months and change in almost seven months mm, okay that's when i hit my first sub and it was against a, a, a wrestler okay it was it was the one and only Oma Plata I've ever hit. <laughs> nice <laughs> during a live roll. I am not good at Oma Platas. Yeah, I don't think but, I've ever. I've attempted a bunch, but I've, yeah, I've never successfully hit one. So yeah, yeah, yeah. I've used it to get out of close guard, like I, while, while attempting the submission. I just wasn't able. I would. I was never able to finish it. But I just think at Oma Platas. But um. Yeah, so that's it, it. Wasn't really, you know. I just stuck to it because I just said to myself, no. Even though, you know, I hate, you know, it's very humbling, mm -hmm. it, it, and that's also another thing, right? Like, you, if you have an ego, and all of us do to right. a certain extent. Yeah. So, if, if you're not willing to swallow your pride and go in and and take the beatings, then it's this isn't going to be for you, and you're not going to last very long. So. Right. Right. Um. I would say all in all, 
my overall journey from white to blue, I started getting my stripe. Like I didn't get any stripes for the first six months or so. So then I got my first stripe about, you know, almost seven months in. <laughs> and then I had gotten my second stripe about uh, nine months in. And then I had gotten my third stripe right before the pandemic. And then uh, when I came back, I trained for another four or five months, I'd say. And then in that span, I was able to get a fourth and a blue, then finally the blue belt. Right. But during the pandemic, it's not as if, you know, it's launching around. Actually, that's when I introduced you to jiu-jitsu. Yep. And, you know, you, you know, you and then my nephew, I was, gra- I was using you guys as grappling partners. Mm-hmm. So, you know, you guys would come over, we'd grapple. So I'd probably say that even though I, you know, trained in my gym for about 16 months, I probably got another good 60 hours or so of training with, between you and my nephew. Right. Yeah, and mm-hmm. I think, you know, doing that was also something that kind of helped me, I, I feel like. Because I feel like if I didn't have you and I just kind of joined a gym, maybe I would feel different. But I think mm-hmm. the fact that you kind of gave me like a – like a crash course and you know you it's like all the things you've learned you kind of condensed it into like a much smaller and you kind of also you know showed me like the mistakes you've made and you know like hey don't do this or don't you know do this or focus on this detail i think that like helped me progress and uh you know get to where i'm at so definitely mm-hmm. want to thank you for that um oh, anytime yeah to be fair, I, I was still a white belt, so it's sort of uh, like the blind leading the blind, right? I, <laughs> right. I, we were, I was kind of like, just like, hey, this is what I learned, and I'm like, hey, let me show it, you know, show you what it is. And then, but during that time, you know, I was able to like, uh, to focus on certain things, you know, certain areas of uh, jujitsu that would pay dividends later on. Right. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of those details definitely did help. You, you know, like, I think something you said earlier uh a lot of people kind of you know like they can't handle their ego being hurt or bruised um the thing that sort of helped me stay and you know kind of just keep going and going like i compared it to working out i know you're not the biggest you know like fan of lifting weights like that's not for you right but you know like that's something i've always enjoyed and i've always done and the way i looked at it is like even in weight training or like you said in you know like an RPG game right like there's a certain level of grind you have to uh-huh. go through to achieve something right so it's like if you're uh-huh. trying to lift uh, like if you have a goal of x amount of weight you can't just go in there and you know expect to lift it right away or you know in a very short amount of time like you have to actually train towards it right like you have to take small steps and you know, you got to work on your form so you don't hurt yourself. You got to like, you got, there's a lot of like steps to it. And I feel like that's humbling. And so like, I also just applied that to jujitsu. It's like, I know I'm going to go in and I'm not going to be good. And you know, that's fine. Like I'll just improve a little by little by little, like every single day. Like my goal was always to just learn at least one thing or one detail that I can maybe remember for the following class. And I, I think you know, that's something that kind of just helped me, you know, like stick to it. Absolutely. Yeah. And you were able to get your blue belt back in, was it June or July? I believe uh, June, right? June, yeah. Like early June, right before my birthday. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That was a, that was a pretty cool, uh, you know, <laughs> like how my wife was there and then coach just kind of planned it like when she was like there and yeah it was uh definitely a surprise yeah it's definitely a, it must have been an amazing moment i remember when i was promoted for the first time it you it, it's a special moment yeah right? I, yeah. I was yeah uh-huh. yeah like i always tell everyone like you know uh, 2000 uh 2023 wasn't great but there are two things that happened you know one my son being born and me uh-huh. getting a blue bell <laughs> so <laughs> yeah yeah. Um, you know, speaking of the blue belt journey, what are some tips you would give to, you know, someone who just, you know, someone who just got started uh, and is looking to get their blue belt? Like, what are some advice or suggestions you would have? Okay. So 
firstly, I want to preface, you know, there's the classification of belts, right? There's, I mean, there are, you know, obviously white, blue, purple, brown, and black, but, um, you know, that in like, you know, there, there are different types of white belts, different types of blue belts and et cetera. So, you know, you can, you know, they have, uh, you have your hobbyists, you have competitors, and then you have um, celebrities, right? <laughs> so those are generally the three types of belts. Right? So you, you have the hobbyists, you know, such as myself, we train consistently. Um, then, you know, you, you, we train consistently, but I don't really actively compete. Right. Um, find it very difficult to take time and I can dedicate an entire day to go to a location, wait around. And I remember when you competed, you, you your matches were pushed back by what? How many hours? Three, yeah. four? Yeah, I, it, I feel like it was just not organized well. But, you know, you live and you learn. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. I remember I was like, I, cause I, I double booked that day. I actually had a, an event to go to in the evening. So I, I didn't, like, I remember coming early your event was it maybe like one o'clock or so and then you didn't even get to have your match until what maybe five yeah i'm not saying yeah uh, ridiculous yeah. um so, so to to get back to the types of bells so hobbyists i think you know they fall under individuals that um that don't compete or compete on occasion then they're active competitors uh, that consistently compete. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, a hobbyist blue belt is significantly different than a competitor blue belt or a celebrity blue belt, or a blue belt right? Because, um, well, let's get this out of the way. Celebrities, they, a lot of times, they don't often roll. Or they never roll, actually, I'd say. Um, like, I think, you know, uh, Egan Machado's system comes, you know, into mind right there. And yeah. where... They don't actually roll. They, uh, yeah, they'll 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 drill. Yeah, Ashton Kutcher, of course. You know, when he's not when he's uh not defending Ravitz, he's <laughs> he's uh, out here. Yeah, you know, pretending to be you know brown belt in jujitsu. Right. Um, we all seen that video of him and Craig Jones. Come on, we know the truth. Yeah, yeah. I feel like you know, like rolls two, don't lie. Yeah. I feel like when I was like maybe a two stripe or three stripe, I could have, I could have handled that. that oh, absolutely. <laughs> but. I, I I look at that. I'm just like, wow, this is a guy that. You, you know what? I'm not even gonna entirely blame Ashton on this, but yes, yes man, probably. Because, yeah, he's he's not gonna say no to the belt, right? He, he's right. not gonna say no to it. So, the problem is, you know, now you're stuck. Because if you really want to be a brown belt, then you'd have to, you know, go to an accredited school and give it back, or tell Egan like, hey, listen, I need to get out of this system and, you know, go into a normal system, grapple with real training partners, not just drill, and do it the hard way. So, right. celebrities, you know, celebrity belts. I think uh, the Valenti brothers also. I think uh, Giselle Bunchen is dating one of the Valenti brothers. Mm -hmm. I think he had left Tom Brady. And then when she left him, her rebound was one of the Valenti <laughs> brothers. Yeah. Hey, listen, man, she got her purple belt in two years without, you know, without uh, sparring, right? So right. This yeah. goes to show. Yeah, um, but yeah, back into I, I guess you were explaining the you know the type of the the rankings, but also like the type of comp there's competitors, there uh, mm -hmm. hobbyists, and there's celebrities. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah. yeah. Competitors, essentially, you know, you, so you have to ask yourself. So now let's, we got the celebrities out of the way, but not, like, now we have to ask ourselves, well, you know, why do you want the belt? You know, right? do, you, do you want to be a competitor? Do you want to just, you know, do you want to train for fun? It's a hobby. Mm -hmm. Because if you want to be a competitor, then, and you want your blue belt as fast as possible, then those those two won't mix right there. I, I, I almost say they're mutually exclusive because you, you can't, uh, Actively compete because you're going to be sandbagged, right? You're, you, they're going to hold out promotions because they want you to win as to... many medals. <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah, they want you to win as many medals. Basically, bring it to the gym so the gym gets more recognition. 
Absolutely. And, you know, it's also, you know, to be fair, to be charitable to the gyms that do that, just just they sandbag is because they know everybody else sandbags, right? So they don't want you to be promoted, you know, early. Like, you know, if you're training, like, let's just say you're an active, you're com- better you train and you train, you know, five, six times a week, right? Mm-hmm. Um, you know that, you know, your fellow competitors might be doing the same. Right. And if you have aspirations where it, they're not just local tournaments, then you're probably training, you know, two plus classes a day, mm-hmm. every day. So, you know, you, it's it's a different standard. But I guess, like, like I'm only going to be able to speak for hobbyists because I'm a hobbyist. So, I would say generally, you know, you'd have to, you'd be looking at about a hundred to two hundred hours of training on average. Right. Obviously, right. it varies from school to school. There's differences with instructors some instructors look at it as you know it's a meritocracy where you have to earn your belt sometimes it's attendance based Mm -hmm. um you have to look at the fact that when it comes to acquiring your blue belt you'd have to um you know just because i say it's 100 hours 200 hours you know if you if it takes you 200 hours in five years you know maybe you might have to spend a little bit more time because you're not consistent so right Going consistently, you know, at, at least minimum, bare minimum, twice a week, you know. Right. I would, I would recommend at least three times. But you know, I understand, like you know, the, there's a large swath of people that want to do, you know, twice a week. But um, so I would say, as long as you, if you can find the time to do twice a week, then go ahead and do twice a week. So, it, but if you, you know. I would say about 100 to 200 hours. And one of the things I would say is the first, you know, when you're a no stripe, first, second stripe, white belt, don't focus on submission. You know, you know, learn them, understand them. But in terms of implementing them in a live role, I, you know, it, it's going to be very difficult unless you're going against people of similar experience right. uh, that are right. you are, right? right? Or as strong as you are, as fast as you are. So... <laughs> Uh, the the first you know up until maybe you know your second strike like I I what I generally focused on was uh, stand up um, I focused on uh, like I would let's see I focused what else did I focus oh I focused on defense I that's that's a huge part of the game you you're not going to feel comfortable going for submission especially as a white belt unless you have you know at least a proficient defense if you can. If you can feel comfortable in, you know, inherently bad positions like you know bottom side control, you know you're under someone's full mount, like you know you're in the bottom of a full mount, you're someone's taking your back. Unless you you know you really feel okay in those situations where you're like, well, I can try to you know I can I have a an escape to work with, then your your offense is always going to suffer because you might because if you look at it like you know let's just say you know, a Simple submission like an arm bar, right? Imagine going for an arm bar from full mount, right? right. You you yeah. have to give up position. You'd have to give up. So you you go from full mount. Let's say you go to S mount, that you transition to S mount, and then you grab your arm, and then you go down, and you and the guy is able to escape from it, right? Now all of a sudden you can get stacked. You can possibly get your guard passed. Right. So it it you know you're going to have to live with the risk. It's a risk and reward, right? You have to live with it. So really focus on survival and escape. Like learn how to escape bad positions and pick one to two escapes that you you feel like you're better at and really just drill it. Learn how to pass the guard. That's another important thing. Because if you can't break someone's guard or you can't pass it, then you're not going to be able to mount an offense right? Right. when you're on. So and you don't you just don't want to be stuck in someone, you know, guard and because you're not it's not like MMA where you can throw strikes mm-hmm. right. Chelsea and lived also sitting in someone's uh you know a close guard and it's you know raining down punches. Right, right. So yeah, I would say mm-hmm, go ahead. No, uh, what I was gonna say is I, I feel like also you know being defensive kind of opens up opportunities for you so like the more you focus on defense 
uh, especially in the beginning because you know like you're you're kind of developing like the the feel for like oh this person just kind of uh eased up on this position or this person kind of let go a little bit right here and i feel like you develop that sense if you focus on and practice defense, especially early on. But yeah, so it's, I just want to piggyback off of what you said. Absolutely. Yeah. And um, then I would say, you know, after your second strike, like when you get to your third or fourth strike, then stripe, sorry, then really start to, to, you know, ramp up. Oh, and oh, one last thing. Let me just preface. I would work on drilling more as a white belt in general than rolling. Like, Later on, at, once you get to like maybe three to four stripes, you're like, you know, at that point, you've gotten to about a year of training. Um, then I would recommend, you know, really trying to <clears throat> ramp up an offense. Like, I mean, obviously, you know, you want to learn a you know, submission. You're going to probably learn the Americana, mm-hmm. whatever, but try to find a submission that you feel like, you know, is, you know has a high percentage chance of, for you, you know, right? So if the success rate of that submission is much higher than other submissions and try to like really develop it. Um, so, and I would say around the, you know, once you get to like the fourth try, really like I start to dabble a little bit in leg lock. Like I, I would, I can't stress it enough. It's, I think people learn leg lock way too late. I think a lot of, there's a lot of, you know, there's a flock of, uh, you do practitioners that have an outright aversion towards leg lock. Yeah. So, you know, a lot of times, you know, people might take it personally if you go for a leg lock. You know, if you're in an open mat or if you're in a, you know, you're just dropping in in a gym. So, I think the best thing to do is to really to, to at least be familiar with it because you don't want to be that guy that, you know, progresses through and you don't, you know, you just, the, your way of avoiding leg locks is to just tell people you don't want to, you know, you refuse them outright. So, you want to learn leg locks. You you want to, like, I'm not saying, you know, you need to get a heel hook game at that point, but just familiarize yourself with, you know, you know, an ankle lock or what have you, right? Just yeah. kind of understand it a little bit, learn a little bit of defense in, right. in respect to that. Right, like uh, Dean Lister said, why ignore half, you know, 50% of the body. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I feel why like... Why ignore it? Yeah, and I feel like a lot of schools kind of make it taboo for, you know, uh, like the white belts or even sometimes mm-hmm. the blue belts. Like, you know, they kind of just hold back and they, you know, don't really teach you. Um, yeah, I've heard stories like, you know, the gym I go to uh, for working out. Uh, yeah, there were like a couple of blue belts. Like, yeah, we haven't learned like locks until X, you know, this time. And we weren't allowed to do them. And so I, I feel like some schools just have that old school, I guess, maybe Gracie mentality. Like, yeah, we don't, we don't do leg locks. Yeah. Like, I mean, a, a friend of mine, he, he wasn't familiar with heel hooks. Like he never experienced a heel hook before until, you know, well past, you know, into his blue belt tenure. And then when he experienced a, a heel hook for the first time, he didn't tap right away. Uh, and uh, he was able to get out of it, but... He, when he got up, he said his knee buckled. He didn't feel right in the knee, and he actually had to get stem cells injected into his knee because uh, he's always had problems with it ever since that day. I mean, listen, it, his training partner should not have held on to the heel hook for that long yeah. either. I mean, I, I personally, I probably would have just let go at that point, but or before he'd even gotten to that point. But, you know, you're, you're never, you know, which, to her credit, she probably thought, you know, or to be charitable, or she probably thought he was okay, or she didn't have it locked in. Right, right. So, I think, you know, when you look at Sambo, I believe there are a lot of kids that train leg locks, heel hooks, and they, they're they at a young age, and they're fine. They're not, they're, there isn't a lot of, um, there aren't a lot of injuries in respect to heel hooks because of it. Yeah. So, I think the more you familiarize yourself with, with leg locks, the less intimidating they become yeah and, and i think you also learn like hey I, I can't take it past this point or you know you kind of get a feel for it uh, I, I think it's like you know like if you think about it the choke or the strangle like you can kill somebody with that right but we know like the mechanics of it we understand like you know like how, like how to take it i guess slower especially if you're rolling with somebody new 
um, you know, like we understand it and you don't, people don't really misuse that. So I, I think the same thing could be said about the leg lock game. Like I think the, the more people understood it and practiced it, the safer it would get, like, as you said. Yeah, absolutely. Like, for example, you don't want to hold on to a, a rear naked choke for over 30 seconds, right. you know, right. just locked in because at that point it might be, you know, there might be irreversible damage. Right. Like so, I mean, even when we roll in the gym, you know, amongst the, ourselves, like, you know, most submissions, we we don't, like, crank it. We don't, you know, like, go full, like, right away, you know, rarely ever, right? Because we're all mm-hmm. training. We're, you know, we're not trying to hurt each other. Um, mm-hmm. But I, I think, you know, if we add the leg lock game, you know, we would apply the same same rule to that. Absolutely. I, I feel like when it comes to submissions, it's always best. And I think it's... It's a great rule. I actually learned from uh, Jiu Jitsu podcasts that I love listening to. The Beyond Jiu Jitsu podcast. Mm-hmm. I listen to uh, that one. Yeah, the Professor Adam Child, he actually said that what he likes to do is he likes to get a submission and then he likes to probably, you know, crank it up to 60% mm-hmm. and then gradually ramp it up. Because if you lock in a submission and you try to go 100%, let's just say you grab a your naked choke and then you're squeezing and how long can you really, you know, hold on to a rear naked choke at 100%? Right, you're going to burn yourself out. I have six seconds maybe, maybe a little, you know, maybe a little bit more. Yeah. Um, but at the end of the day, then you start to see, then if that person, let's just say, has, you know, just a little bit of room to breathe, and then, as, you know, as soon as they start to feel you fading, then they're going to say, like, well, you know, I can, I can hold on. Mm-hmm. And I can ride this one out, and that's what they do. And then they'll try to escape after that, right? Because they'll survive it. But if you get it to sixty percent, and then you slowly ramp it up to seventy, eighty, ninety, then um, it's demoralizing for your training partner. And a lot of times, at that point, that they would tap. Right. Even if, like, I've told people that I've done it, and it's one of the best pieces of advice I received in jujitsu because I used to like just try to get to 80, like, I would go from, like, 80 to, like, 100, and I would try to hold on to the submission. Mm-hmm. Well, when I say 100, I mean, as you know, not like I'm trying to break the person's arm or choke the person out, but I would really try to, like, ramp it up. Right, right. Yeah, I think, mm-hmm. uh, you know, the tournament kind of gave me, uh, like, a different perspective on it because uh, most, like, arm bars and things like that, uh, you weren't there for the second match because I think you had to leave, but... Mm-hmm. Um, the guy basically did a French armbar and like the he like cranked it right away and you know like mm-hmm. my elbow was like messed up for you know remember like when I came yeah. back and, yeah messed up for like a couple of weeks um, but yeah in the, in the tournaments I think you know it's a different mentality like if you have something you just go for it right away uh, mm-hmm. you know uh, but but yeah I think when we're like for hobbyists and when we're rolling with our friends we you know we want to keep rolling with them so you don't want to have them get injured and you know next thing you know you don't have a training partner (laughs) so Mm -hmm. yeah um, yeah i think i don't think i've ever really injured a training partner that i could remember so right hopefully if you can yeah i mean i feel like this is a you know full contact sport and accidents do happen so um Mm -hmm. we just we just got to be careful as much as we possibly can absolutely yeah um you know like speaking of kind of taking it zero to a hundred what do you what impact do you think uh strength has in jujitsu like you you know i know a lot of people especially non-practitioners they they put way too much emphasis i feel like on strength um you know what is your take on it oh no i think it absolutely matters i mean you know is would i rather be stronger than than I, you know, than I am now. Absolutely, mm-hmm. I'd love to be stronger. Who wouldn't want to be stronger? <clears throat> the problem is, you don't want to rely on your strength, right? You, you want to like because at that point, where does this, you know, where does the strength end and the technique begin, right? right? Like there's just, I mean, like you, you can see like you know, strong men that grapple like you know mixed martial artists and. Uh, like I think Dustin Poirier grapple, you know, strong man, and I was just able yeah. to. Uh, was to, it Thor? 
or no no it was the other, might have been no no it was the other guy uh gordon gordon ryan uh uh basically like uh, rolled with uh thor uh mm-hmm. in the mountain yeah mm-hmm. like, that's that was actually really cool like you you got to see someone like you know twice maybe three times his size and strength mm-hmm. and you know gordon still was able to like pretty much you know be in control uh, it, it, I remember I seen a little bit of that role with Thorne Bjornsson. Yeah, it was uh, that was a great role. I think, I think like I think strength definitely matters. But I think you don't like when you see someone that's you know like a like a Rusa or Paul Haller is right. Like that's like, juice to the gills. Mm-hmm. Like at what point would you say like you know is he is he really technical? Is he just you know? I mean, obviously he's ripping submissions and trying to injure people. But you know, at what point would you say that? you know oh yeah he's a he's a technical grappler well you know i mean maybe he's a good grappler that just happens to be really very very strong right 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 yeah Mm -hmm. um you know speaking of strength and like competition uh what are your thoughts on juicing you know i know like a lot of local competition get you know have a bunch of people especially you know in the blue belt and purple belt you know juicing even white belts surprisingly uh yeah I, I find it kind of weird that you're just you know juicing at such an early age and you know especially for like local competition but you know maybe they have aspirations to get somewhere further but yeah i, w- I would love to know what you think well this is gonna be a bit of a hot take i don't mind this is some, coming from someone that's never juiced before mm-hmm. i don't mind like i i don't really have an issue with people because at the end of the day it, it's your body, you know, <laughs> your you body, your choice, do what you want to do. And that's like your bodily autonomy, right? Like, um, the problem is like, you know, if you want to like, you know, if you want to go out and drink, you know, drink on weekends, you want to, you know, you want to smoke, you want to do whatever. I don't mind as long as, you know, it's, it's jujitsu, right? If it's mixed martial arts or boxing, that's different because you can give someone brain damage or, you, you know, cause seriously serious bodily harm so at that point mm-hmm. my view is in jiu-jitsu it's it's you know the norm right i mean obviously you know if you're juicing for local competitions it's your sole reason <laughs> then i would you know then i i think it's odd but hey, you know you, you're free to do so right right yeah yeah i, I mean you, that makes sense yeah i think mm-hmm. you you said it well um mm-hmm. yeah i think if strikes are involved you know the risk is also higher and you're sort of breaking contract, right? Like, you know, if the yes. other person agreed to fight someone who's, you know, have a fair fight, this person clearly has an unfair advantage. So, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. I think you should be able to bring up criminal or civil charges against them if they if they violated the, the terms of the contract. Right? Mm-hmm. And because you agree to fight them under uh, the, under- well, the understanding that they're not, you know, enhance, right? Like they didn't take anything, right? That they didn't take any performance enhancing drugs. If they did, then they violated that contract. So at the very least, it should be a civil suit because you know they received a perk for it. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Now, I mean, obviously, you know, when you think about like typical fights, like maybe let's just say you're the undercard of you know a local MMA or event. It's you know you probably have to go after their personal assets because the the purse isn't going to be a whole lot. Maybe you're getting maybe a couple hundred dollars, mm-hmm. you know. So, right. Like even if you're like, uh, you know, the undercard of the UFC event, what was it? I think at the time, eight thousand to show, eight thousand to win. If I'm not right. mistaken, right. And that's a UFC. Right. So, yeah, yeah. I, I think uh, you know your your perspective definitely makes sense. Uh, I, I I would agree. Uh, switching uh-huh. gears. Um, what would you say is the best? No pun intended. <laughs> what would you uh, say is the best martial art for self defense, uh, especially like in a street fight situation? Okay, so street fight, right? So this is going to be a bit of a long answer. Um, short answer, I'm going to say, you know, you have to be aerodynamic and grappling in specific uh, aspects of Muay Thai. Let's explain. So, you know, you think about a mixed martial arts match, right? And you're going to say easily, what are the best, you know, what are the best uh, martial arts for a mixed martial arts match, right? Like wrestling, right? Because the rules favor wrestling. You have jujitsu, obviously. You know, you need to know 
how to sub, you know submit the guy or finish the guy on the ground. You need like some type of striking. So let's just say you know boxing or what have you, right? I'm just throwing it out. So mm -hmm. there are a lot of control variables in a, in a mixed martial arts match, right? right? Mm -hmm. So um, there's so many different ways to win, but for the most part, like you have gloves, you have a mouth card, you have a cup. You're in a cage. You're, you know, I'm not sure the size of the octagon, but that's already predetermined. So you, there are a lot of control variables. But in a street fight, think about, you know, the number of independent variables that you see in a street fight, right? Like, are you where? First of all, where are you fighting? Right. Are you fighting on on a, in a field? Are you fighting on cement? You know, in a public road? Are you fighting on marble tiles in a store? Like, first of all, where is this street fight taking place, right? So. All of a sudden, if you're fighting on concrete, that's going to limit the type of takedowns that you do, right? Like you're probably not going to, you know, shoot for a double leg on concrete, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, you know, so you know maybe you're more inclined to shoot one in a you know in a grassy field, right? In the park, that, I could see that happening. But so you have to look at, and then like you know you have to look at other variables, right? Like where are you? Are you in a desolate area? Are you are you positive that you're alone with that other individual? Right. Um, if you're alone, you'll be more inclined. You know, is there CCTV footage? Do you have? Is there? Is there a crowd? Mm -hmm. Do you have to account for maybe people in that crowd that, you know, your assailant might know? So maybe there's a certain decorum, right? Because if you're if you know that there are cameras, probably you need to and you know you need to show that our witnesses in general, like you have to. So show that you're not the aggressor right yeah not, you have to convey that it's self-defense and so you have to if you you might have to let the person be the one invading your space or you know appearing as the aggressor before you can make a move right so obviously you know you want to keep your hands close to your face even if it's like this something subtle because you don't ever want to have a point where you're moving your hands from um from a resting position all the way up to block something mm -hmm. yeah you know yeah that makes sense so mm -hmm. so you you know you have to keep that you know in account does the person have cauliflower ear if you're if he has cauliflower ear and you're you know you have six months of grappling experience do you think it's a good idea to <laughs> to try to shoot for a takedown no right, <laughs> right. and you then know? also the the variable of a weapon yeah mm -hmm. yeah well if, yeah it's, it's a weapon and you know you in you know are you in a concealed carry state or, you know it, right so many variables so, so yeah. but let's just say let's just say if you're in a situation where the thing like you know if you're dealing with multiple attackers right then i think so let's start with multiple attackers and because i think it'll also translate well for a single attacker mm -hmm. well my my answer at least so obviously you need to know how to grapple because at the end of the day when you know how to grapple if you get taken down, you fall down, you can then you can get up. If someone's there and in a situation where seconds matter, you need to be able to get up quickly. Right. Or um, if there are multiple attackers. And my opinion is if you're facing multiple attackers, first of all, it's not as if, you know, like um, the chance of you winning with each additional attacker is exponentially harder, right? Mm -hmm. If there are two attackers with three attackers, it's so much harder to win that fight. So and one versus two, right? It, it's much, much harder to win. So you have to look at it like this. You, if you're, if you have, let's just say, two people attacking you, you can't count on a knockout because you know a lot of fighters will tell you like it's usually the punch that they that they didn't expect would knock the other person out is the one that knocked them out. Right. Like, they said, well, I threw harder punches in that fight. But it's just that one punch that they didn't see coming. Mm -hmm. And uh, well, the, the opponent didn't see coming in, and they themselves, the fighter, didn't think would knock him out, was the finishing blow. So you can't rely on that because, you know, they might close the distance on you. They'll try to swarm you and try to grapple with you. Mm -hmm. So my opinion, in my opinion, I think leg kicks, um, especially cab kicks, mm -hmm. are very effective. In, in a street fight, especially against multiple attackers, because, you know, I'll just give a personal experience. Um, when we were doing uh, like <clears throat> MMA for a little while, right, and uh, my cousin and I, 
So we went to a mixed martial arts gym, and um, you trained with us a couple of times. You can probably tell the story, but um, what we so one of the sparring sessions that I had, I went up against a guy that was throwing a lot of leg kicks because I was getting the better of him in boxing, but because when he was playing my game, but then they said, "Hey, stop boxing with him." Um, my coach was like, "You know, he was you know throw kicks at him." So what did he start doing? He threw leg kicks. The first one, the very first leg kick I felt, complete shock to the system. I didn't expect it. But I was like, okay, I can deal with this. Like, it hurt, but it wasn't, you know. Right. Uh, like, I'm not, you know, um, it, it's, it, I can tolerate pain. It's not, you know, it's not like if I would get hit in the face or what have you or hit with a body shot. So then he threw a second leg kick, and I didn't know how to check it. Maybe about five, six kicks into it. Mm-hmm. My leg, like at that point, I couldn't really put weight on the leg anymore, the lead leg. Mm-hmm. So at that point, I had to, I, you know, I think he threw one or two more kicks, and at that point, I had to, I had to switch stances. Mm-hmm. And I'm, I'm a natural southpaw. I had to switch to orthodox. I didn't know how to really box orthodox, but at that point, I just couldn't put weight on that leg like I initially, you know, did as southpaw. So, imagine throwing calf kicks or leg kicks against someone, and yeah, adrenaline is flowing, right? Because you know, there's there's a lot that can happen you know, during a street fight when um, the adrenaline is flowing. But if you throw five, six leg kicks at a person, what at some point it's going to it's going to pay dividends because at that point right. they may not be able to put weight on it, and it doesn't take very long. Right. Even if they don't so, feel it, they won't be able to um, use it effectively. Yeah, and all of a sudden, if you throw leg kicks at that person, maybe three or four, and then you throw three or four at another opponent, um, you know, I'm not going to tell you that you're going to win the fight, but you know, I think it'll, you know, I think at the very least you can outrun them at that point. If you, yeah, if you slow them down fight. and kind of get out of that situation. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because you know, at the end of the day, street fight is about survival. You're, you know, you're not trying to, you know, you know, winning a street fight would be to, in an ideal world, is, you know, you know, finishing the guy and getting, you know, and not getting in trouble with law enforcement. That's right. the ideal scenario. Right. And you, you know, obviously, you're not taking any damage. So, yeah. So when you're going up against an opponent, let's just say a single opponent, then. I think, you know, even if it goes to the ground, right, even if you take it to the ground and you know that, okay, maybe this is not, there are no spectators so and you don't see anybody else in, you know, the immediate vicinity that you think would come in to, hit, to help them. So at that point, if you decide to take them down, because then you have to assess the fact that there's a risk if you get into a boxing match with him and you, you know, you, you punch him so hard that, you know, he breaks a jaw or he gets knocked out and his head hits the pavement. Mm-hmm. But if you can, you know, take him down and choke him out or what have you, then that's, you know, he's going to have a hard time building a You know, well, his defense team's going to have a hard time building a case against you. Right. Like because you weren't the aggressor. Just... Mm-hmm. Yeah. You I already think, weren't the aggressor. Yeah. Uh, wasn't there like a similar story with um, uh, this guy in New York City? Maybe like sometime last year. I can't remember no, but... when. Uh, he was a jiu-jitsu was black belt, guy, right? right? He was a black belt. He mm-hmm. uh, stopped this guy and basically just sort of mounted him or maybe took his back and just held him until the cops came. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. That's what I yeah. That, I mean, you know, in an ideal world, that'd be great, right? Because mm-hmm. if you feel that, you know, you're stopping a criminal, you know, sure. But a lot of times it could just be someone that, you know, maybe, you know, said something, you know, looked at you the wrong way and then made a comment. Or he, you know, said something about your girl, and you know you can't let that slide. Because there's are certain things you know you can. There's a lot of things you can let slide. But I think if somebody were to insult like you know your child or you know your spouse or what have you, this, you know, there's a certain level of pride that's going to come into play, right? Right. And you're not going to want. You're not going to allow that. Right. Right. So yeah. So mm-hmm. so some type of grappling and muay thai or uh, leg kicks, basically. Those would be yeah. your ideal, ideal martial arts, or ideal things yes. for street fights. 
And one last thing about that, I think, you know, a lot of people feel like, okay, a blue belt, like I know Helio Gracie said that blue belt, the definition of blue belt is someone that can, you know, that can beat someone uh, that's, you know, of a reasonable, you know, size larger than them, right? So like if they're maybe within, you know, 40 pounds of them or so, that mm -hmm. you should be able to beat them in a grappling match. Now, I don't think a blue belt is necessarily enough in a street fight because I think seconds matter. Right. in a street fight so like the difference of like hitting a submission like and look I, I think a blue belt could be enough to win the fight but i think you know you you know i think time is important mm -hmm. and i think you need to get out of that situation as quickly as possible so i think you should the more you train and the further along you are in blue belt then i think a middle you know middling blue belt might be i would say the bare minimum in order to feel confident against an untrained opponent right Right. Yeah, that's fair. Um, you know, speaking of the uh, streets and uh, fights, what do you think about mm -hmm. cops learning some type of grappling or them, you know, sort of like grappling be a, being a requirement for them to be a cop? Like, what is your thoughts on that? What are your thoughts on that? I think, I think it's absolutely necessary. And Well, let me say this. I, I don't like to see police officers, you know, attack civilians for nonviolent crimes. So, you know, in that event, then no. I mean, obviously, other than theft, if, you, if you're trying to steal from, but, you know, we obviously know that, you know, New York and San Francisco, they don't really go after you for the theft. Right. So, uh, you know, so, um, yeah, like, uh, so for so that reason, I mean, you know, you're, but I think, like, let's just say, assuming it's a legitimate crime, you know, legitimate crime, and that person needs to be detained. I think it's absolutely essential. I don't understand why police officers don't train. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, you know, I, I, you know, I hear like you know, I astounded. You know, I like just seeing videos of police officers. You know, I seen like two, three police officers at, at a time, like trying to subdue an opponent, and yeah, that guy's able to get up and run away. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, there was like a recent no, one too. Get out of. Yeah, what was, was that? No, no, I said uh, there was also so, like a recent one where uh, I think the guy got into a car, right? And then he like, he, like drove off. <laughs> and the level left. of yeah. disrespect. Yeah. You know, to, to say, listen, not only do I not respect you, neither, either, either of you three being able to hold me down, but I'm just going to get into my car and drive off. He didn't even run away. He yeah. ran away, you know. He got into his car and drove off. Yeah. Yeah, I feel like it definitely probably, should be a requirement for them. Those cops were so slow, I could swear that he was adjusting his side mirrors, too. <laughs> yeah, he's, like, fixing his rear view so mirror, <laughs> you know, like... Yeah, he, he had the time. I think he adjusted both side mirrors, <laughs> the left and the right. He, he had all day Yeah. to, to, to escape that situation. Yeah, I, yeah I, I don't know why they, you know... They don't include some type of grappling with their firearms uh, training because I feel like that would help their firearms. Uh, you know, like drawing. You know, uh, basically, like if someone tries to grab their gun, because at the end of the day, you're gonna have to grapple if somebody tries to grab your gun, right? So mm -hmm. I, I don't see why it's not like part of it. Yeah, I, I think with the, a lot of police officers, I mean, you know, they're not pressure tested, so if they're not in a situation where like, imagine, you know, going to jujitsu class. And I mean, obviously, I'm not going to say that, you know, let's just say a shootout happens, that that's not as intense as a, you know, as a jujitsu match. No, I'm not, I'm not saying that. But right. I'm just saying that, you know, I think, you know, being in, you know, ex being exposed to high pressure situations like a jujitsu match might help them with their nerves. Because, you know, there are a lot of trigger happy police officers, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. How many, you know, unjust police shootings would you see a year and i'm not going to say it's predicated on race or anything but that's another story i'm just saying in general police officers can get a little too trigger happy can pull the gun in situations that don't warrant it like i've seen a video recently of an individual telling the police officer you know that he had a gun you know he had a registered firearm that is in the trunk of his car and he was trying to exercise his rights right. but then what happened right like the cop in that situation 
reacted poorly, pulled out his gun immediately because the person was not immediately complying with what he's saying. He just wanted a rationale. He was like, listen, I, you know, I understand my rights. I, you know, X, Y, and Z. No, but the police officer pulled out his gun. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think his uh, mm-hmm. family was uh, in the car, right? Uh, oh, this was a different situation. I think you were thinking, what was it? Um, Orlando. Was it Philando Castile? I think yeah. that one. Yeah, that's the one I was thinking of. His family was in the car. Yeah, he, this was where he... This was another situation he had this was a few years ago. Okay, yeah. He um, mentioned that he, you know, he had a gun in the car, and then he said he's reaching for his license and registration after the cop asked for his license and registration. Oh, that's okay. And yeah. then the cop pulled out his gun and said, <clears throat> you know, don't reach for your gun, and then or something like that. Don't reach for your. Yeah, I think he said something like, "Don't reach for your gun," or and then the guy's like, "I'm not," and then he just fired several bullets, killing him in front of his his family. Like appalling, you know? It's yeah. Police officers. Yeah, yeah. I think, did. like you said, I think some type of grappling will give them a level of pressure testing that they may not be uh, be used to. I feel like even like wrestling, like even if you you know take wrestling, I feel like it would probably help. Mm-hmm. I mean, if you know the you know the individuals unarmed, right? Mm-hmm. Or they, if they say like they have a gun in the car, you would assume that they're not if they're you know providing you with that information then I don't think you need to be in like you don't need to have make it into a high pressure situation. Right. It you know, you don't have to take it to a ten, right? You can keep it at a three or a four. You can raise your you know, raise it and you know, maybe certain red flags might go off and then you you know, but at that point, that doesn't mean you have to draw your gun. Because I feel like as soon as you draw your gun, a lot of times they're inclined to use it. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. Yeah. Um. Yeah. Sounds, they sounds good. Yeah. Yeah. 